Okay, we're, we're live. This is the April 26th meeting of the Disability Access Advisory Committee um, in Amherst. And present at the meeting are Elise Link, Marty Smith, Saren Darren, and me, Myra Ross, and Maureen Pollock, who is the town um, liaison, staff liaison to our committee is here. And uh, Maureen, I don't know if anyone else is here. Uh, we have, Mar sorry, did you, I was multitasking. So, uh, so Marty are, Smith, yeah. Elise Link, and Saren Darren are here. I don't know if you already said that. And then we have yes. um, some guests here. Uh, we have Guilford Mooring, our DPW superintendent, and we have Jane Wald of the Emily Dickinson Museum. I believe she's the executive director. And uh, let me pull up the agenda because I can't recall who's going first. Sorry, are you there? Yep. All right. I had I, I don't know what to do when you get a phone call in the middle of a mute when, when, <laughs> the, Zoom when the phone is sitting right next to you. Um, okay, all done. Um, so the first um, level that you said there were other people here? Yeah, uh, Guilford Boring is here okay. from our DPW and Jane Wald, the executive director of the Emily Dickinson Museum. Okay, so the first thing we, um, does anyone have any announcements? Elise, did you attend uh, the demonstration? I wanted very badly to, but I was not able to get there. Okay. Meyer, right. do you want to mention what the, what, what demons, can you? Uh, oh, uh, there was a disability advocacy demonstration in Northampton oh, um, I on Saturday. That. I was in New York. I don't know where, I, Elise was the only person who thought she might be available, but you know, people with disabilities have trouble getting places. So yeah, you know, I attended sort of a, you know, you did. I did. Yeah. It oh, was cool. really well cool. attended. Uh, I, oh, I attended part of it i didn't they did a parade i think from the train station in northampton to pulaski park in downtown northampton um so i i didn't I, and um they were escorted from the with the assistance of the police um for the route and then they had a rally at pulaski park and it included various speakers and they had music at the end from uh, local musicians. And it was really well attended. I, I would, my guesstimate was probably at least a couple hundred people were there. And um, I believe um, the first speaker was, I believe she, she mentioned she was the chair of the disability committee in Holyoke. Um, and um, they had various other speakers, um, uh, someone um, with different perspectives or in dis di uh, different disabilities. Um, and so, yeah, it, it was, you know, a gathering about promoting, you know, disability rights, you know, it's, it's the law, it, it promotes, you know, diversity, equity, inclusion, and it uh, promotes good urban design. Um, so it's it's really a, a threefold of why disability rights in designing for that and you know fixing problems when they arise are, are really important. And they had some really good examples of um, that um, the Northampton Dis Disability Committee had noticed issues with particular restaurants or businesses in downtown Northampton, and they approached a, f a few of them and had really good success stories of the, you know, the particular coffee shop just, you know, was naive and didn't realize something that they were, weren't doing properly. And they, you know, quickly uh, alleviated the problem. I feel like they, um, it was like fam familiars coffee shop. It's on strong street. Um, they, uh, were providing, um, like, uh, um cur curbside pickup and they have two entrances and i believe both of them were ada accessible and so the disability committee was saying hey that's not right and so they were able to um 
make one of the entrances um ada accessible and it was a, a it was like a nice success story it was like the story you want to hear is that the business owner is like oh whoops sorry we never thought of that yes we we're happy to work with you and and then you know they got into some stories of you know businesses that just don't necessarily are willing to have you know conversations or to make improvements um where needed so but it was a very positive uh, rally and um, and I felt very inspired as an ally. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for going. Thanks for telling us about it. And uh, did anyone on this committee know about it in advance no. of, the, of the announcement from no. Maureen? Somebody said- no. I didn't know until a couple of days before. I didn't either. How about I you? Saying, hey, hold on. There was a nice article in the Gazette with pictures and everything. It was like a, almost like a, in two pages. So it was very detailed. Well, that's yeah. nice. I yeah. wish, they, wish that our committee had been notified about it. I, I did actually put it in my email last week, but I guess it was. Um, yeah, no, you did put it last week, but you they did. obviously planned it. I mean, they obviously planned it, they set it up, they had speakers, they had presenters. I mean, this didn't happen spontaneously and somehow um, didn't get to this side of the river. So I think that's an interesting question. Well, it was very Northampton centric. It was for the community of Northampton. It wasn't really sort of for the, you know, for the, uh, like the whole Valley. Um, yeah. It was very specific to the city of Northampton. Not that yeah, you know, non-Northampton yeah. residents weren't yeah. invited, but yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, anyway, it's uh, it it was very nice. Thank you for going. I was in New York. Yeah, it's a good so, start. Yeah. Um. So actually, since you mentioned it this way, Maureen, um, when you mentioned it as part of diversity, equity, and inclusion, I'm wondering if we should have an agenda item. Um, that invites the director um, to come and talk. Yeah, no, that, that sounds like a great plan. I believe that person hasn't been hired yet. And oh, they didn't choose that person. I've been seeing a lot of interviews uh, here in town oh, hall. Okay. Um, I So I don't really know the status of that yet. But yeah, once that person is hired, absolutely, they should okay. um, be invited to uh, one of these meetings. Okay, cool. Excellent. Thank you for going. Um, so the next item is public comment. Is there anybody here to make a public comment? Um, no, just the, just the two applicants, Guilford and Jane are the only okay. ones here today. All right, then we can move on to um, the Evergreens is the first one, right? Yep, so uh, Jane, I'm gonna make you a, uh, a panelist. So you're, you'll switch over in one second. And Jane, before you... Wait, she can't hear you start. at this. Oh, she okay. can't. Oh, now she can. Oh, she was just switching over. Okay. Sorry. Okay. So before you make your presentation, the written material that you sent had a lot of diagrams. Um, and at least I wasn't able to tell what the variance request was. I was able to tell what you have been working on thus far. But so if you can really pinpoint what the issues are and don't assume that we've all been able to read it, that would be really good. Nope. So welcome to our meeting. Um, the Evergreens is a really cool place. Um, it was owned by Austin Dickinson, right? And his, uh, his wife, well, yes. And afterwards she had it, right? That, that's right, yes. And then yeah, his after daughter. He took up with Mabel Loomis Todd. Right. Okay. Right. Okay. It's a uh, yes. Thank you. It's a very storied place, as you um, <laughs> as you as you uh, mentioned. Uh, so thank you uh, for allowing us to to come and um, explain our our project and the variances that we're requesting. Um, I do have some uh, slides to uh, illustrate some of the points, but um, there's really nothing in the slides that I'm not going to explain. Um, 
okay. during my remarks. Um, so would you, um, I, can, I can keep the slides off until I get to the a point where, I, where something should be illustrated. Um, well, people, do people want to see the slides? I'm the only one who can't read them. So and people might want to read them. I don't know. Yeah, pull them up. Okay. Yeah, I think you can put them up. All right. Okay. Um, and is that clear? Is that uh, at a size that's... Sure, why don't you, could you do it the presentation? I will. Um, yeah. <laughs> Okay, well, um, so I'm here today uh, because, um, you know, we've been, uh, we've come to you before uh, for a, a large project a few years ago, and the variances that were approved at that time, this is back in 2016, um, they're expiring because the value of a pending project um, exceeds 30% of the assessed value of the property. Um, and essentially we're asking for continuation of the previously approved variances and don't, ha don't really have anything new um, in them. Um, in February, 2016, uh, this committee offered its support for um, the museum's variance requests uh, uh, saying that, that, and this is a quote from um, what you approved, they made reasonable accommodations while trying to preserve the historic significance of the structures. And that's really, um, it's the same thing that we're trying to preserve the historic significance and want to um, uh, just explain again what those are. Um, so I'll give you sort of an overview of the museum property, the sort of physical setting, um, the project we're bringing to you um, and the specific request for variances. There are, I believe, six of them. Um, and uh, just a kind of a summary of our existing and pending um, ADA improvements. Um, so the Emily Dickinson Museum property is comprised as I'm sure you know of two historic houses connected to the Dickinson family, the Homestead and the Evergreens. The current project is proposed um, specifically for the Evergreens. Um, and that property uh, has um, a, a, a number of historic designations. In 1977, it was uh, made a contributing property in a National Register Historic District in 1982 on the State Register of Historic Places. Then in uh, at two different times, 1996 and 2007, um, entered a preservation restriction with the Massachusetts Historical Commission. And in 2012, it became a contributing property uh, in the Dickinson Local Historic District. Uh, so the, um, the Emily Dickinson Museum has developed a plan to improve the environmental conditions at, uh, necessary to preserve what is really an extensive Dickinson family collection, most of which is stored at the Evergreens. Um, the, uh, the collection's environment or the kind of quality of the atmosphere within the house um, over these you know, 150 years and more Without, without adequate ventilation or, or distribution of um, both heating and cooling has created uh, an environment that is actively um, adverse to the preservation of uh, fine collections items, such as a, a good example is that the Dickinson, the, the Dickinson, Austin and Susan Dickinson at the Evergreens um, collected a, a, quite a number of uh, oil paintings. And those are probably some of the most sensitive materials uh, that need to be in a controlled environment and they just have suffered over the years. Um, so this project includes both um, non-mechanical work, which is mostly um, carpentry and architectural alterations as well as mechanical and electrical upgrades. So uh, mostly an upgrade to the heating, ventilation and cooling system. Um, so these improvements, the goal is to uh, decrease moisture infiltration, 
um, specifically to inhibit water intrusion in um, areas such as a, a, a bulkhead um, overflow from a, a, a poorly constructed um, roof line uh, to improve thermal and ultraviolet barriers and ultimately to stabilize the interior environment uh, at the Evergreens. Uh, um, so the, the so I'll just um, kind of briefly summarize the the components of this project. The first is to reconstruct an areaway foundation wall, the and the entrance steps and plank doors to uh, to the cellar. Uh, so this uh, construction right now, the 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 stone walls that create that foundation structure for the steps that lead down into the cellar are, uh, are porous and they need to be rebuilt and, and water sealed. Um, this area way, this, uh, it, this area under the bulkhead um, acts a, a little bit as a stream when, um, when there's been a lot of wet weather, or rainy weather, and uh, just water kind of pours <clears throat> down into the cellar. Um, so that's um, that's one of the work items. Um, I mentioned membrane waterproofing and subsurface drainage in this very in this same area. Um, there's a very complicated set of roof lines that come together uh, in a, a, a very constricted area, and uh, so the the water the uh, runoff water from the roofs. Uh, is is very concentrated, and so uh, more waterproofing and subsurface drainage will help to alleviate that problem. Um, Can I interrupt? Um, yes, I'm fascinated by all the historic preservation, but uh, in the interest of time, because we have other agenda items, can you get to the to the questions that might have something to do with this board that have to do with um, the accessibility issues? Because okay. I mean, I'm sure we all want you to fix the roof, and I'm sure none of us have an objection to climate controlling the inside of the building, but I'm not really sure what you're looking for from us. Okay, uh, so yes, I'll get right to that. Um, so the the variance request, so we've submitted a, a already submitted our um, application to the Massachusetts Architectural Advisory Board, and there are th six variances that we are seeking to um, continue. One is um, section 25 uh, uh, concerning entrances. So our request is that a variance be granted to be relieved of the requirement to provide an accessible entrance at the main front door on the south elevation. Um, so this relief is requested uh, owing to the preservation of the main entrance exterior fabric and the structure as it, um, the, the front elevation as it appears to the public. The, uh, the main entrance um, is not uniformly used for public tours or programs. Um, there, is, um, uh, there is now uh, an acceptable um, approach uh, on an accessible path. So the alternative accommodation that we propose is that the existing accessible ramp on the east elevation, which is used by all visitors and staff to the building, shall be maintained. The existing accessible ramp um, is approached from a, a newly built uh, accessible path installed between the evergreens and the homestead that connects the two properties on a compacted organic lock surface that um, provides a, uh, for the first time now, provides a, uh, a steady, reliable, uh, and firm surface for, um, for pedestrians and wheelchairs. The second variance is concerns um, signage. And um, that request is that a variance be granted to be relieved of the requirements to provide exterior signage that identifies the existing accessible ramp. And we're asking for this uh, because, uh, because of our um, goal to present the historic landscape as it was during the Dickinson family period. Um, so the 
what we propose as an alternative accommodation is that visitors with accessibility needs will be escorted by a guide led docent led tour and brought uh, to the access ramp and rear uh, entrance where visitors uh, typically enter the evergreens. The third request is concerns handrail height um, uh, in, uh, for the main staircase. The original staircase is uh, a prominent feature of the main hallway and it's still furnished as it was at the end of the 19th century. So that includes its original wallpapers, works of art uh, that uh, line the wall up the staircase uh, and the furnishings for that hall. Um, the addition of an ADA compliant handrail on the wall would um, uh, significantly disrupt the historic character of that kind of unusual preserved interior. Um, the, uh, we know that that hallway was last decorated with that wallpaper in 1892. So that gives that, that whole environment a kind of distinctive you know, 125 year old atmosphere that we hope to conserve and stay, stabilize and conserve. Um, is there an open banister on the other side or is there, there walls on both sides? There is a banister on the um, outside of the staircase. So it's open staircase on one side. Open, open staircase on one side. That's okay. right. Okay. Yeah. Great. okay. Um, the, I'm sorry, were you going to no, I just wanted to know what it looked like. Okay, all right. Um, so if so, on the wall side, if we were to um, install an ADA compliant height of thirty-four to thirty-eight inches, that wall would um, it, it would disrupt the the artworks that have been in in the, those places since nineteen thirteen, um, and then uh, the installation of a handrail would also be uh, impeded by a door to, uh, as you get up to the, to the first landing on that staircase that leads into a back hall, um, that would constrict the entrance into the back hall. Um, so our eternal proposal for an altern alternative accommodation um, is to, um, so should, if the absence of an ADA compliant handrail were to pose any kind of difficulty or barrier to a visitor, the interpretation of the second floor historic space would be accomplished on the first floor through a means appropriate to the needs of the visitor. So that could include printed or visual materials. We also have an iPad accessible virtual tour uh, and we have um, quite a number of uh, illustrated essays on our, on our website that give um, uh, 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 substantial information about the, about the second floor experience. Um, and, though, and there are uh, guides. The, the guide who is leading the tour is usually accompanied by a, an assistant who can remain with visitors um, and, and give in-person explanations, answer questions um, if, if certain individuals can't um, uh, go up to the second floor. And then um, the fifth, yes, uh, the fifth variance request concerns an elevator. Uh, and it is requested that a variance be granted to the requirement to provide a vertical access elevator within the evergreens um, for access to the second floor. Um, so there's not, there's not a space within the house that, uh, where an elevator can be inserted uh, without significantly disrupting its historic uh, fabric and character. Um, if a, uh, the, the building itself is, is not a large building so that um, if, an, if some kind of exterior structure were added, uh, then the, the unique state of preservation of the, of the evergreens itself would be compromised. Um, so as an alternative, uh, the first floor of the evergreens is accessible to all visitors on those guide led tours. Um, museum staff uh, assist uh, visitors needing 
assistance with interpretation uh, and with an experience of areas that they're not physically or visually or orally uh, able to access. Interpretation of the second floor historic places, spaces takes place on the first floor via, again, via in-person staff interpretation, um, an iPad accessed uh, virtual tour, uh, and the, the information available on our website um, that can, be, can also be accessed right, right on site. Um, the, our public programs, we hold uh, public programs other than the house tours that go to the second floors, all of those programs are held in uh, fully accessible spaces. And then the, the last variance request has to do with a public toilet room and a drinking fountain. So here we're asking that a variance be granted uh, to the requirement to provide an accessible toilet and drinking fountain within the Evergreens. Um, and this is uh, because they, they do not currently exist. Um, and we, uh, we're, we're asking for this relief uh, because of the preservation of the historic materials that they, that they are able to remain intact. So the alternative there is a fully accessible unisex toilet room and uh, a water cooler that are provided by the museum at the tour center located at the homestead. Um, so that's, those are the variance requests. Um, I think, you know, what there may be just four more things I might say, uh, and that is that, uh, you know, we'd want to maintain the accessible exterior ramp and entrance door located on the north elevation as, as, been, as it has been functioning for um, these, these several years. Uh, print and video with alt text and personal interpretation of the second floor spaces uh, for visitors who can't uh, ascend the stairs will be maintained. Um, the, the toilet room and the water cooler and the homesteads tour center will be maintained. Um, and there will be um, uh, expanded, ex ex uh, expanded accessible exterior parking at the homestead, a loading zone uh, and signage uh, at, the, at the homestead. Um, so uh, that's, that's our, a summary of our request. And um, if you have other questions, uh, please let me I'd be, be happy to answer them. <clears throat> that was very thorough. Thank you. Um, anybody have any questions or comments? Marty is raising her hand. Okay. Yes. Um, I just want to sort of recap this in a different way. Um, as I understand it, this application is required because you're doing more than 30% of the value of the building and doing these infrastructure projects, because that's what they really are. You're not impacting the structure itself as far as the historical or, or anything like that. So that's why this is required. These variances have already been approved once before. And we, you have to come back because if you exceed 30%, you then have to bring the entire building up to code. And as an architect, in my mind, the footprint of the building is too small to even begin to address those issues. But because this is an infrastructure project and not a <coughs> renovation project that affects the architecture, um, I make a motion that we approve this variance. Is there a second? No, I have questions. Okay. If you don't mind, can do I ask for do clarification? You want to delay the motion? Well, uh, it's uh, someone makes a motion, so someone yeah, seconds but it, no second. and then no second. and then you have a discussion. There's no second. Oh, oh, oh. So, I think the motion is premature. That's all I'm trying okay. to say. So, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, um, Sarah. Okay, so the first question is um, on the sign, you know, direction sign. So this is going to Are you to talking read. about the, the accessibility signage? Is that what you're asking? 
Is that what you? I, I don't know. Is there any way we can see what those the list of the um, wave variance request is again? I think it was. I think number two was about signage. But signage to the direction of the accessible entrance of the building. Is that yes. right? Yes. So what is the what is the reason for requesting that? Uh, the, the, well, the reason, let me, um, maybe uh, I'll keep this picture here for just a moment. Th this access, this path has been newly constructed as an accessible path between the homestead and the evergreens, um, as it appeared, uh, in period photographs. The difference is of course that it's, um, you know, it's a, it's a, a path with a, significant foundation and drainage so it's really to it's to serve visitors to move from one house to the other and um, here at the end of the path this is the accessible entrance so the route from the homestead to the evergreens leads directly to that accessible entrance where all all visitors will go um, the approach to the evergreens um, the the landscape um, the natural world and landscape, is um, kind of a significant component of the Emily Dickinson Museum's interpretation of um, the family's life uh, on this property between these two houses in the 19th century. And um, we're, um, we're hoping we'd you know, prefer to keep the amount of signage um, kind of uh, it, keep the amount of signage um, down so that we're not in, interfering with that, uh, with that natural and cultivated landscape. Um, yeah, that, that and, was- uh, do, you, do you look into the inconvenience that this might create with people with mobility impairments? Because I remember you saying there'll be staff positive people that are available to assist anyone or show directions. And I personally am a woman with a disability, mobility impairment, and I know those things, how difficult it is to find somebody who can even answer the questions or who knows what you're talking about. So uh, I strongly have strong feelings about that the signage, it could be painted in just, uh, in nice, in colors that uh, matches with the background. I'm sure architects and uh, have more uh, information on it, but it's a ma major concern in my mind. Another thing also was the handrails inside the ramp, but I couldn't quite understand where is this ramp located that you need the handrails. Uh, so let's see. The, I think it's uh, the next the, next one in that the list. The variance, I think, Saren, is for the staircase going to the second floor. They don't want a hand. They don't want a handrail on the wall side because it interferes with the with the actual art on the wall. So, like, if there is an old uh, person trying to get a little support. Or somebody with MS or something or uh, right. They would whatever. they would have to go on one side only. I mean, you could clear the staircase so somebody could get up or down on the exterior banister side, but there wouldn't be any way to have two-way traffic if somebody needed to go the opposite way. May I ask what side of the wall um the what side the handrail will be on, the one that's existing? It is on the right as, as you ascend the stairs. Okay. Um, so I may, if I may uh, try to answer a couple of the questions raised. Um, the, uh, to your, your question about how to find the accessible entrance, um, all of our tours are led by a guide so that anyone in a tour group will be personally escorted across this path to the, to the accessible entrance. Um, so, so you're saying a person cannot go 
directly to the evergreens, no matter whether they're completely able-bodied or disabled, that everything originates at the homestead and then you have to be escorted to the evergreens. You cannot just approach the evergreens on your own. There's no way to get into it. That is correct. Aha, okay. Because there correct. used to be. So, um, okay. Yeah. So I guess what she's saying is that the gateway is the other house and nobody can approach. That was actually my question. It was a programmatic question, okay. which is, does everybody need to have an appointment? Does everybody need to filter through the same um, setup? And I guess what you're saying is you can't just show up. You have to have an appointment and you have to filter through the homestead. That, that that's right? correct. Yes, that's correct. You can, um, it is possible to um, come to the homestead now uh, without an appointment and find a place on a tour as space is available, but no one can enter and tour the houses without, without going through, um, a, you know, the central tour center. Uh, okay. So that answers your question, Saren. Nobody has the right to go in <laughs> on their own. So it doesn't matter where the, the accessible entrance, whether it's marked or not, because no one has the right to go in without, no, you know, without accompaniment. Like if you could walk in off the street, Saren would have, I would support uh, what she's saying totally. <laughs> because if you can walk in off the street, you need to have signage. But if you're not allowed to walk in off the street. That's, what, that's uh, correct. Well, the, need... that is a, for the time being, the rules the, uh, the society will set might be different. So maybe it is not open uh, to uh, people. Maybe, maybe somebody came for an event and they said, oh, what the heck, the, uh, let's go and make a, a visit and let's see where Emily Dickinson lived and things like that. So, you know, I want to make it open to anyone, you know, like if you pay a certain amount of money to visit, make a visit or something like that, you know, but limiting the number of people in the building at some point, it might come to that at some point. You know, and I think it should. It shouldn't only like making appointments. Not many people uh, can, when they're visiting, like they're coming to Amherst, say for a wedding out of town. And they say, you know, they, they wouldn't know what they're going to do. They walk around and then they discover, oh, this is a good thing for us to uh, go and see if we can get in and see where she lived. You know, that kind of thing. So it kind of eliminates those people from visiting the site, so. I think that's a point taken, Saren. Marty, did you have a, you've raised your hand? Yeah, I did have one thing to say um, and to ask. It appears from the photograph that the only pathway from the main building to the evergreens is this path. I don't see a path to the original house front door. I don't see any other path. There is no, am I, am I correct? Uh, you're cor there is a, um, there is a front walkway that is directly, that leads from the front door down to Main Street. And that leads down two flights of steps. So um, the way we're wanting the site to, to operate, to work is, for uh, pe uh, people in vehicles, people who need an accessible route to the Evergreens, if they're in pedestrians or vehicles, to come uh, to the homestead, which has a uh, less steep incline, there's accessible parking right at the homestead. And then this is the only path from the homestead to the Evergreens. And it is a way to manage the, um, uh, the, to get around the two flights of stone steps that lead directly from Main Street to the Evergreens. Do you allow people to enter from Main Street? Um, the purpose of this path is to, to, it is to eliminate as much as possible 
the need for a docent-led tour to take people down to Main Street, across to the Evergreens on the public sidewalk, and then up the front walk, which is not an accessible path to the Evergreens. So we want to minimize uh, the difficulty that that front walkway poses to our visitors by providing a flat surface, a flat and accessible route. Does that I understand that, but do you allow the public to enter the site from that walkway with steps? Um, we do not prohibit uh, access to the grounds. People, people may walk onto the property uh, from, from that Main Street uh, gate. We do, and they enter the house? And they do not enter the house without a guide. So the front door is locked? That's correct. I would suggest or that you, I'd like to suggest that you consider closing that entrance to the site and have everyone who comes to the site go to the main entrance. Mm -hmm. That way, this becomes a moot point. Yep. Yes, I. She's right. I think it's a good idea. You and that way, you, you know, second class uh, citizens, you have to have every everyone has to have equal access. To yeah. The yeah. Okay. Yeah. So if people want to get onto the grounds, they can go in through the homestead and they can walk onto the path and they can deviate from the path onto the grass. Is that what you're saying, Marty? Yes. Okay. So that everyone is using the same entrance, whether it's open or not. If you're allowing the general public to go on the grounds, you still need to have, it still needs to be accessible. Correct. Right. Everyone should be have the same experience. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, that's um, that's a very important thing. Now I want to say um, I wasn't on this committee in 2016. Um, the only one here who was was Saren. But since that date, Emily Dickinson Homestead has come with a presentation, and we gave a variety of suggestions for accessibility, many of which you have included in the presentation that you made, um, you know, um, programmatic accessibility and stuff like that. And it would seem to me that since it's all part and parcel of the same experience or really the same, um, you know, it's the Dickinson Homestead tours, people could go on one of them or both of them, um, that we incorporate the statements that we made about accessibility from the Emily Dickinson House presentation that was made, because I thought we had a very good discussion. I thought we were all very pleased with the outcome of that presentation. I don't know if you remember it, Sarah and Elise. I don't think you were here at the time, Marty. Um, yes, I was. But, I oh, do you remember it. The very first yeah. ones I attended. Ah, okay, cool. All yeah, right, sorry no, about I remember that. it. I remember and it. I, I thought, you know, this is all the same thing. It's just a different Actually, building. Actually, it isn't. Myra, I have, it isn't. To, I have to disagree with you. Okay. Um, the way it works is each structure is uniquely separate. Oh, yeah. I mean, structural for sure, but programmatic. I, um, we made a lot of programmatic, even programmatic suggestions. They, the, they consider each building separately. Okay. Well, you yeah. certainly know more about it than I do. But yeah. I think Marty's suggestion about access to the property um, is correct mm -hmm. and that way we don't need accessibility signage um so that we wouldn't have to uh have any you know uh discussion about that i guess the stairwell handrail i don't know what could be done um i mean the handrail going to the second floor on the i guess what you're saying is that it's um it's something that would not only interfere with the character, but it would interfere with the uh, wallpaper, which is historic. Um, and right. so I don't know the rules about that. Marty, what do you know about that? <laughs> well, I, a couple of things. One is that stairwell is too narrow for two people to even pass. 
Aha, uh -huh. okay. So it's a moot point um, okay. in, in my mind, because you, as you go up, you'll grab the handrail on your right side. As you go down, you'll use your left hand. Mm. Um, okay. When you have a really it's, wide staircase, well, you do need two rails. I mean, if this was a six foot wide staircase, I'd say, yeah, let, we're gonna have to do that. But it would be also very difficult to do something that was in keeping with the period of the structure by putting a handrail because they never would have had a handrail there. Right. And this is just such a small building. Yep. And I just, I can't imagine wanting to do that. And this is a standard um, request for historic buildings. This is, I mean, I've been in a lot of them and you never see the second handrail because it just reduces, it destroys a character, right. the visual character. Yeah. And again, the staircase is a residential size staircase. It's not a public staircase. Uh -huh. This was a home. Yeah, it's just a, it's just a small. Um, yeah, it's a very small. I mean, small I've been up restaurant. there. Um, I've been up there. It's, what's really cool about that place is all the furniture that Susan Dickinson ever owned is still there because she never yeah. threw it anything away. So it's all pushed <laughs> up against the wall and the new stuff she bought is in front of it. So you, what I would love to see is a way for people like me to get a sense of the changes. If you, like if you had gloves and I was able to touch the furniture that she's got stuffed up against the wall and then how 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 it all changed over time that would be really really cool yeah, yeah. she's got a oh, lot yeah. of furniture in there <laughs> I, 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 I want, were you gonna say something oh just uh, on the, about the furniture i once counted that there were she had enough chairs and sofas and so forth for 100 people oh, oh my wow. god yeah. <laughs> So in the interest yeah. of time, um, yeah. No, do you uh, want to amend your motion, Marty? Sure, I'll amend my. I'll amend the motion to approve our grant approval for this for the variances with the concept that the um, museum closed the entrance from Main Street and have all people entering the site come through the main entrance. The main accessible entrance. I have one question. Yep. I'm I'm sorry to, to postpone this. Um given that there's only one entrance and one exit, what God forbid happens if there's an emergency and people need to get out? Is that just one way out of the building? I this is I know I'm it's trying not to out of the it. building. It's not out of the building, it's out of the site. Oh, okay. It's not out okay. of the building. Thank you. Sorry. She's closing the front gate to the in oh. front of the walkway that okay. there is a gate. And she doesn't want some people to be able to enter through there okay. and the other people who can't go up the steps to have to go a different way. Okay, sorry. I couldn't visually picture that. Thank you. Can we okay. have a second? Um, yes, I'll second it. All right. Um, so is there any further discussion? So we, uh, the motion is to approve all this one, two, three, four, five, six of them in one package. Correct. Approve them all. Yes. Well, to approve the variances, um, but to also close the, you know, so it's yes, approve and to close the main gate so that everyone has to go through the homestead accessible entrance. Yep. They sort of go together to make it an accessible project. Um, can we do can a you, roll call? Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, Elise, yes or no? Uh, oh God, yeah, I'll say yes. Do you have an, well, I guess Saren? we're voting. Sarah. I'm abstaining because hmm. there are still some things in my mind that doesn't satisfy my, the way I look at this. Okay. I would, uh, Marty. Yes. Um, I'm inclined to vote yes, but I'm really concerned yes. that two people are not voting yes. 
um, because it seems to me that they've done the best that they can with programmatic access, but I don't know, I don't know. Um, is there anything that could make you change to a yes, either Elise or, or Saren? No, I'm gonna change mine to yes, because the problem I would have with that stairwell is a personal problem that just pertains to me and people with guide dogs. And that I just, I, I wanna say yes, and just not, you know, I say yes. Okay, Sarah. Is there what happens if I stay is still abstain? That's oh, fine. You can abstain. I just wondered yeah. if there was anything that could make you feel I'm more I'm not very about convinced it. with the uh, with the inappropriate inappropriate look of signage. I'm not okay, convinced so. on that. So that's why yeah, I still I, want I to abstain. But you know, that's a simple thing to fix at some further time. But you know how the, to enforce the ADA, right? You have to sue. That's the only way. <laughs> that's the way it's written. I'm not saying that as a joke. That is the way the ADA is written. So someone in some former time, in future time would have to make a complaint and that would be the way that try to negotiate it first, but that's not a big change. It's not a structural change. I'm gonna vote yes. Um, so I guess the motion carries three to one abstention. Um, and I do mean it about the box of gloves to touch that furniture, because that's an accessibility issue for people yes. who don't see well. Yes. Th that is such, um, that's really an amazing um, aspect of that house. Um, you know, it, it has to do with who Susan Dickinson was, but it also has to do with the fact that we get to see a lot of historical furniture and those of us who can't see it need to touch mm -hmm. it. So yeah. you really need to have gloves and you need to make it possible for people to, you know, visually impaired people to touch the furniture. Absolutely. And I don't know how to put that that's, in there. Okay, that's a good. Thank you. That's a very good idea. We are, um, we're, we're uh, as you probably know, doing a restoration project at the homestead right now. and we will be opening that building with kind of newly decorated configured spaces. And um, that I think, and the evergreens will remain closed while we do this project. But I think the opening of the homestead gives us a perfect opportunity to, um, to implement okay. a, a kind of please touch That's with really love. cool, thank you so much. Yeah. I mean, Thank I've you. been so many places where they don't let you touch even a sculpture. And I'm That's like, true. oh, come on, give me yeah. outdoor sculpture. So it's not like nobody ever touches it because the weather's on it all the time. Anyway. Thank you so much, okay. Jane, for attending. We need to move Thank on you. to the next item. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Thank you very much. Guilford, um, are you here still? He is. Uh, I'm uh, making him a panelist. So they'll oh, okay. just take a minute. I'll be right back. Hi, Guilford. So you're going to tell us about Pomeroy, where you are. Are you at 75% now? Or We're pretty there... much at 75, if not 80%. Okay, so, okay, so, um, so you have, me... again, the pictures, um, there wasn't a lot of text. It was all pictures. So I really have no idea what you sent. Let me uh, hold on. I'm just adjusting. I have to. I turned you guys all down when you were in the other meeting. Sorry. Okay. Um, okay. I can share. Let me share this with you. And All right, this is the basic layout for the roundabout. Um, let's see, here can, is it centered well enough? That's, I can make it larger if I need to. Um, that would be helpful. It hard, yeah, it's hard to good. read. All right. 
We'll start at the south end down by Mission Cantina, then I'll make it bigger. So there's actually gonna be five crosswalks in this project, not just the four around the roundabout. Um, so what you're looking at now is the south end of the roundabout. So you're approaching from Atkins Corner. Uh, you'll come up in the islands and there'll be the roundabout across uh, West, West Street here. Um, there are, there's little notes here. There are two proposed RRFBs at this, inter at this crossing. So when you walk up to it, you'll hear it beeping. It'll uh, draw your attention to the rapid rectangular flashing beacon. Um, you, you'll be able to push the button. The beacon will, when it turns, starts flashing. It'll say the lights are flashing. You can, well, actually, it just says the lights are flashing. It doesn't say whether you can proceed or not because there's no stop control with it. It's up to the, that's just the way the, these beacons work. So Do you have an arrow? Right here. It's right in this area. I'm so, oh God. All right, I can't see it, but whatever. Sorry, go on. So does Sorry. it say the lights are flashing, you are crossing West Street? Or does it just uh, yes. say the lights? It can it say, say it. it can say their lights are flashing, you are crossing West Street. Okay. That can't That's be put what it into. needs to say. Um, okay. So and how far from the end of the roundabout is that? Um, it's actually like one and a half car lengths, so it's about 30 feet. Oh, so actually when the cars, before they really speed up, after they left the roundabout, that's sort of where it is. And yes. So they're not going to have started to speed up and then have to come jam on their brakes again. No, they won't. Okay. Okay, cool. Thank you. And right, um, so then that's the south one. Um, the two on West, well, one's on West Pomeroy, one's on Pomeroy. They're set up the exact same way. Um, there is the round, the RRFBs at both sides. So you can push them and they'll be, they'll be beeping at you as well. And there's about 30 feet between the roundabout and the crosswalk. Um, and then the north side of West Street, the same. The crosswalk we added, or actually while we're here, there is no diversion. There is really no diversion in the island, the center island. It's just lined up straight across. What is there that? Are mean? There are tactile pavers in the island. So when you're walking across the street, you'll leave one set of tactile pavers, cross the road, and you'll hit another one, which means you've come to the other side. And then there'll be another set of tactile pavers before you actually venture into the next travel lane. So you'll know. Can I, can I go back? When you said no diversion, you mean it's a straight line? It's a straight that line. That That's what that means? Okay. Yes. So we essentially, had... if you're walking, you're going to be, you're going to cross the street. You're going to get onto the island. And you'll know you're on the island because there are going to be the little domes, mm -hmm. but you don't have to deviate from your direction. Correct. Okay. People had talked about the fact that they would like to go up to the island and then make a right turn or a left turn and go down a little bit more and cross again. Um, there's not enough roadway width to actually accommodate that type of movement. So we just lined everything up and we put the tactile pavers so you know when you're crossing into the island, you know when you're crossing off the island. Okay, so you can cross through the island and you can cross anywhere around the island. Yes. The point, okay. Um, then, then the north side of the roundabout is set the exact same way. On each side you have an RRFB. It's the, audible ones that tell you it's there and then tells you when the path you can cross and what you're crossing. Um, and then we actually put in a second crosswalk down by the bus stop and the Moan and Dove. Um, let me make it a little bigger. And that is north of the this is north of the intersection. So if you're coming from Atkins, you'll go through the roundabout, you'll come out of the roundabout, 
the gas station was on your right. There's a new bus stop and pull off on the right. And there's a new bus stop and pull off on the left. But then you can walk forward, you can walk north and then cross over to go towards the USDA facility or Amherst Gymnastics or that, fa that facility there. There'll be a crosswalk there. So it's about 300, 400 feet away from the intersection um, so that people on the go using the bus system don't have to walk so far to go back and forth to the two of the apartments that are in the area. Nice. Yeah. And that's the basic layout. Um, sidewalks, sidewalks are at least five feet wide. Um, there's a bike share station for people who want to get to the bike share station. There's a sidewalk to that. Um, new bus shelters. Um, that's about, I mean, that's the basics of what we have for walking and crossing the, the travel lanes right now. Are there any questions? Yeah, Myra. Yeah. yeah, I know you're concerned about the separation of bikes and pedestrians, and they've done a real nice job of that. The bikes are on the road level and the pedestrians are on the curb side. Good. Perfect. Thank you. Good. I know that's a major concern for you. Yep. And me. And Elise. Yep. Well, and anybody who doesn't want to compete with 25 mile an hour. Yeah, bikes. So, electric bikes. <laughs> yeah. I have yeah. a question. Uh, the, uh, you talked about, uh, Guilford, you talked about blinking lights. Uh, do we press the light to go off uh, when we're attempting to cross the walkway, oh, yes. through the walkway? Yes, you'll, you'll hear a, a You'll hear the beeping sound, which will tell you where the light button is. And then, yes, you can press the button and then the lights will come on and you can, then you oh. can cross. Oh, okay. I like that. So the location yeah. of the light posts, are they in the same place? So when you approach from any point, are you going to find the button on the right side of the pathway? So if you're going forward, the button will be on your right. You know, like no matter which direction you're going, the 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 beacon button the the pole will be on in a constant place or are you going to have to sort of bang around with your cane to try to find it <laughs> the, the the button will be facing the direction that you'll be walk the direction of the path so um some of the poles are on the side of the sidewalk so you'll walk in front of them and they'll be off to your right if you're heading south and they'll be off to your left if you're heading north on that sidewalk and there's a few poles that are actually at the end of the sidewalks so that when you get to the end of the sidewalk, the pole is at, at that end and you push the button and you can cross. Marty, I can't see it, but does it look to you like there's any consistency to it that somebody um, yeah, I would? I think there is, Myra. Guilford, can you go back to the roundabout, please? Yep. I just want to verify that. Myra, they're on the... Oh, they're not consistent. No. You'll, the you'll one, uh, it would be best, Guilford, if they could be on the outer edge of the sidewalk, if they're consistent. So the one by Mission Cantina, if it were on the outer edge of that sidewalk, it was just across the sidewalk, then they would all be consistent that they're on the outer edge of the sidewalk, because most of them are. There's only two that aren't. The one by uh, across from the um, gas station isn't, but if you could move it to the other side of that sidewalk, then they'd all be consistent on the outer edge. Does that they make sense? Should be pretty close to the street so that after you push the button, you don't have to walk 10 feet to find where to cross because you want to know that, you know, you yeah. want to, you want to have a sense of when you're going to be able to cross. So here's the button. I pushed it, I can line myself up with where the street is and I can cross it without having to walk far to get there. It would be so, the width of the sidewalk you'd have to walk. To make them consistent because of the situation that they have um, across from Mission Cantina, the sidewalk butts up to the curb. There's yep. no 
you can't place. put it right yeah and okay. there's a couple of other locations that you can't put it inboard so would it be better to have them all outboard or they're a mix right now just because so of the can you conditions can you describe what inboard and outboard mean? Well, inboard would be on the road side of the sidewalk. Outboard would be on the on the outside edge of the sidewalk. Well, it would seem to me that there is a standard that has been developed by people who know this stuff better than I do, professionals in the field, which is why I wanted you to have a consultant to figure out where those lights should be placed so that people can expect to find them there based on a standard. And I don't know how you feel about it. At least you can probably see where the pole is. Um, but no, I, know. I can't really on this on this thing. And but I mean, when I you're walking, like to... you can usually see it, right? When I'm walking, yeah. If it's if it's clear, um, I can usually see it. I'm going to also teach my guide dog where to find those things. Um, let me ask one quick question. Um, when you're crossing, is there an audible signal when you can walk? There's a audible signal that says the lights are flashing. Okay. It doesn't mean, it's not a stoplight. Right, so it doesn't so, say that, the, yeah. it doesn't say it's safe to cross. It says the lights are flashing. And the lights flashing signal the other drivers. To yield to you, yes. Yeah, okay, I've never used a roundabout before, so I'm asking a lot of questions about it. Yeah, um, yeah. I, I don't know the answer to Marty's question about inboard or outboard. There is a standard, though, that people who, who know this, who've studied this all over the place, have developed. I don't know the standard, which is really why I suggested that you hire a consultant. Or I don't need her. Ask so a consultant. Um, so, about where they should be. They shouldn't be just haphazard. They, there's a standard for how to put them in. Or where no, there's, there is a standard and they're all pretty much within the standard that you need to be. There are two of them that are a little far away, a little too far away, but they're the only place they can go without being hit by traffic. So mm. that's what, where they are. Um, the, the rest are in a, a spot where they meet the requirements for the distance from the crosswalk to the travel way. I have a, a little question about the, um, the south entrance to this, school, uh, to this roundabout. Say people coming from Hadley through the notch and through Atkins and everything. It seems like the distance between Atkins and this intersection is hot. It's people just go at speeds, um, maybe around 45, 50 miles an hour, I would think at least. That's so right. is there some, some kind of a alert to the drivers uh, like there is flashing lights right now, slow down or something like that. So with this project, there are signage, there is signage alerting you that you're coming to the roundabout and the slow down. Um, in the future, we actually, we are actually hoping to put at least two more of these roundabouts going farther mm -hmm. south. So mm -hmm. one will be in the vicinity of Deep, Deep Woods Drive and West Street, and the other one will be in the vicinity of Glendale and West Street is kind of what we're hoping to create sort of a corridor where you go through a series of these and you're slowing, it kind of slows you down the whole way through the village center. Mm -hmm. That's the long term. For the short term, when we put this in, there will be signage that um, warns people you're coming into the roundabout. I see. Okay. I want to go back to the consultant. Um, who did you ask for the standard of how to put where to put the RRFP RRFBs? We we use the standard from Mass DOT for the RRFB placement, which is based on what they've developed with the Architectural Review Board. Okay, so. Um, 
from what I can tell, everything that you presented is done with um, the best that you could do without having consulted someone who knows about this from experience working with blind people. The Mass DOT may or may not be up to date on what those people who have made a career of studying how people can cross the street safely have done this. And that is why I sent the name of a consultant to Maureen. Um, and it was allegedly a four, you know, you, you allegedly received it um, months ago. And, you know, all that person would need is this picture and say, are these lights placed in the best possible way for blind pedestrian safety? And I, I would like to make a motion that we make it make, I mean, we can't make you do anything. We're advisory, but all along I've been asking for this because I don't know the answer to the question, but before you build it, I would sure like you to consult someone who does know the answer to the question. And so is so, the consultant is gonna charge for that. So I do not have funds you know, pay. some of them might charge for that and some might not, because all you're asking is, is this, have I placed these lights in a way that it, you know, given what's here, um, you know, there's a guy who works, there are people who work for the Commission for the Blind in Massachusetts who, um, you know, who have this as their field of expertise. And if they looked at it, they might be able to give you some suggestions. They could not charge you because they work for the Commonwealth. They would not be allowed to charge you. Um, there is the woman that I referred, um, who used to be the head mobility instructor. It wasn't even clear to me she would charge you. Nobody investigated any of it. So yes. I am, I am, I'm sort of, uh, all right, well, we'll put it in the memo and, and, you know, yeah. um, and, well, we're going to put it in the memo, but that, you know, you know where things that are suggested in the memo go. So I, I think it's, a, I, I have said all along, I said to the town council, I have said everywhere, I don't know the answer to this question. Everything you did, Guilford, might be perfect. I couldn't tell you, I can't see it, and I don't, I don't know what the best state of affairs is. I know that most of what's around in most places doesn't work very well. But if we're going to build it, we ought to build what does work well. And, and when you why, said lights, you meant the um, the, the flashing rapid, beacons. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Light. yeah. Okay. yeah all right. Well, push. so point taken. Guilford heard you, and uh, I don't feel like he needs to provide a response. But he has heard you loud and clear, Myra. So, um, are there any other comments or questions about this project? Could we also know what the outcome of Myra's suggestion is? Yes or no? Or there's no money and we cannot do it? Or it's going to cost this much? And so. Because many, many times my frustration always, as you all know, is you bring up something and nothing happens or you have yep. no idea. Yep. Well, we put it in the minutes and we ask for this or that and then we find out that it wasn't done and it wasn't an insignificant yeah. thing that was requested so yes um i mean this is not the first time i brought this up it's not even the second time or the third time so i mean yes. what he did might be perfect it totally yes. might be i don't yes. have a way to know that's all i'm saying and i wanted somebody who knows much more than i do and much more than looking at regulations um, would help us find out. So um, I'd like somebody, I, I can make the motion if you want, but um, I- Marty, like did you have a comment or question? You raised your hand. Yeah, oh, good. Okay. Yeah, I raised a hand. Pat's not here to answer this question, but I thought we were given a line item budget. No, the this committee was pass. not given a line item budget, Okay. Um, but the town has for municipal buildings for ADA improvements. Well, you know, if it's helpful we... to all involved, I'm happy to reach out to the consultant on behalf of this committee and see if the consultant can provide us some comments, uh, you know, over the, you know, I could talk to the person on the phone or by email or see if they could come to a meeting. 
um, so we could do the leg work ourselves if if that's of interest to everyone. That's of uh, interest, and I don't see why that. Yeah, that's I like talking to people, so I'm happy to hear hear what a consultant would say, particularly if it's free. Right. Uh, obviously, or exclu if exclusively if it's free. Well, Maureen, we pay so much taxes anyhow, so I think we can find like five hundred dollars to pay for that. If that is the case, uh, I that that I I um, I would need to talk to of course, my you supervisors. Cannot, you cannot, you know. I mean, I don't know. Five five hundred dollars in the world we live in right now is always a lot of money. I mean, if they yeah. if they're not going to charge anything, we can ask and we can see what they say. But if they yeah. want to charge us, we have to regroup and decide what we're going to do. Yeah. Well, well, at least I could have a, a, you know, a quick, friendly conversation on the phone with someone. And, yeah. and I mean, it seems like it's a sort of a, a minor detail that they, you know, would not spend, you know, longer than five minutes looking at if it is purely just looking at the location of the uh, flashing beacon. So um, we could just see, um, see if they're willing to provide free, quick guidance. Marty. And also they can look at it if it's the, and, um, you know, it would be nice if they have the plans right in front of them, mm -hmm. they can say, oh, also, you know, if you did it this way, that would be very beneficial for the, um, for some folks with vision impairments and blind. So they might have some other suggestions mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. I'm actually yeah, reading the federal detail. highway um, manual on uniform traffic control devices. And it's not in there. They say mm -hmm. that they say that these controls have to be within uh, six feet from where you step into the roadway. And they have to be within five feet to the side of that uh, curb cut. And that's all they really say, other than it has to be on a, a paved surface. So having a consultant might really help. Someone who who's, is specific knowledge is in this about the location right. of where it's supposed to go. Yep. Okay. Yeah. So does someone want to make a motion that we go on the record with on this? Sure, I'll make the motion that... that um, Maureen, speak to uh, the consultant that, that you've recommended and see if we can get someone, get them to review it quickly. I'll second. Okay, um, vote, oh, Saren? Yes. Elise? Yes. Marty? Yes. And me, yes. Um, so I thank you. Other than that, it seems like you've done a lot of really good thinking as far as, you know, what we can tell um, from what we know. It seems like um, we don't have any other suggestions, right? Yeah, I want to say it looks really, really good, Guilford. Thanks. It's going to be, I drive through there all the time and I am really going to appreciate it. I like the islands. They're great. I think that'd yeah. be very protective. And I'm sure also, all there's the an island at each. Yeah, there's an island each. So each crosswalk, each even, crosswalk has an island yeah. on either side of it. Even the crosswalk that's at the uh, north end by the um, Moan and Dove has an island in the middle of the oh, road. Yes. Okay. Yeah. I just figured you were putting the crosswalks at the after the roundabout, thirty feet, so that there wouldn't be an island. No, no, there's no a, islands protecting each side. And yeah, that's that, cool. those also help to slow traffic. Yes. That's great. Yeah. That's and it's really one good. lane like each way, right? Yes. There's only one yes. lane on each side. Okay. Uh, Myra, I just noticed yeah. there's a member of the public uh, that's raising their hand. Um, did you oh, want to sure. entertain? I'm, I'm certainly taking... willing to. Um, let's see here. The public. Oops. Ask to unmute.
Can you please state your name and your address? Hello? I don't Is know. there somebody there? Maybe they didn't want to speak. Oh, I believe it was, it was I believe Tracy's it's Tracy. There. Yeah. yeah. Oh, you said uh, Tracy. I did unmute her. Maybe she. I don't know what's going on. No, she's still there. She's still there. Maybe she doesn't want to speak. I don't know. Well, all right. Tracy, well, Tracy, if you, if you want to try, to oh, but she's raising her hand again. Well, maybe she's having technical difficulties because you are unmuted, Tracy. Uh, try to press star six and try to talk. Maybe that'll help. I don't know. Oh, okay. oh wait, we hear you. There she is. All right, great. Sorry, I was just testing the mic. I don't know what was up with that. Um, so I, I just had a quick question about the one, the crosswalk that's going to be near the Mona Dove. So how I can't far... hear you very clearly. Can you okay. speak up? Can you guys hear me now? A little I'm speaking into my mic. But... Can you hear me? Sorry. Sort can you hear me now? Yeah. Um, yeah, go ahead. My question was about how far away the the roundabout crosswalk is from the moon and dove crosswalk. And just that, you know, sometimes when people come out of crosswalks, I mean out of roundabouts, right? Their first instinct as a driver is to accelerate and so just to make sure that people and i understand that um the moon and dove crossing is gonna from the diagram it's gonna have a rapid rectangular flashing beacon too but just you know there's a way to keep the traveling narrow or something just so that people don't get that instinct or and how far apart they are i guess my question good point so it's 350 feet from the center of the roundabout. So it's about 300 feet from the exit to the roundabout. So, okay. Well, I mean, it's, that seems like, I, I guess it's not so far, but hopefully, hopefully people won't try to accelerate much or if they do, you know, the road could be narrowed a little bit. I mean, that's where the bus stop is too and stuff. So, so is the, if you were getting off the bus on the northbound bus, is the crosswalk going to be north of the bus stop or south of the bus stop? No, we couldn't do the crosswalks the way PB, or PBTA likes them. We actually ended up having to move the crosswalks north of both the bus stops. So okay. they're not behind the buses when you discharge. Okay. Well, it's good that they're not behind the buses. Just I just know from driver safety and where pedestrians get hit disembarking from buses, right? That, um, you know, there are cases where just the drivers aren't aware that the disembarking passengers are gonna cross the street. And then sometimes the drivers will go around the bus or whatever. So that's a pretty common way that um, bus riders get hit when they're getting off. So just to like think about the safety of that. But I mean, hopefully, hopefully people won't just get off and get hit, but. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Tracy. All right. Okay. Um, I think we're done with this topic. Um, can you come back in May and let us know, or Maureen, I guess you can, Maureen, you can let us know what the outcomes were of the conversations, meaning that if they think that the project was great, um, well done, no suggestions, we, we just need to hear that. And if there are suggestions, then um, we need to hear that too. And probably as soon as you can find out, perhaps before the, well, the May meeting's only in two weeks, so that's fine. <laughs> it's hard to believe that May is around the corner. When you yeah. said May, I thought that was months from now. Well, it doesn't that's next week. Because it's not warm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's why. There's flowers out there though. Somehow they think it's spring. Okay. Um, all right, thank you, Guilford. I appreciate right. that you're being Thank you. Thank Bye. you. Thank okay. you. Um, the next thing is just the minutes, right? Oh, no. Um, but I don't even know what time it is. Well, we're, we're almost are, one. Yeah, we're right. running out of time. Marty, so I just uh, want to say about minutes. Um, does, can we do those quickly? Because it would be nice if we could put them out. Um, I have one suggestion on the one that had to do with the 
oh god was it march or may you wrote myra smith on one of them <laughs> of course i did <laughs> and um, well both of us both both of us were the people who talked about the topic but the one that says myra smith was my comment the one that was her comment does say marty smith <laughs> sorry <laughs> I try. And that was on the March 8th? Or which... uh, you know, I don't know which one. Just search I'll for I'll check Smith. both of them. <laughs> check uh, uh, Barney did, versus... Did anybody, did anybody read the minutes? Is anybody willing to, uh, able to approve? Does anyone have suggestions? Or can we just approve them both in bulk? Don't all answer at once. <laughs> <laughs> I make a motion to approve both sets of minutes. Cool. All right. Anybody second it? I'll second Elise. Okay. All right. Um, so we should vote. Marty? Yes. Sarah? <clears throat> yes. Elise? Yes. And I vote yes too with the change of my response. Okay. And it sounds um, like every uh, all other items uh, that are on the agenda will need to be postponed to the next time because yeah. we're out of time. Oh, I just have one thing I need to tell Okay, you can say one okay, thing, but that, that's it. And that is, I'm participating in the library um, open house on Sunday. There's an open house yeah. this Sunday, and I'm I'm manning the table for accessible universal design and accessibility just so I you know I, be there. I have to be in Boston. i wish i could so. be there um Ooh. yeah okay well that's Sarah, good information go? marty Ooh. can you email me that i'll information? try pardon marty could you email me that information yeah sure, sure. all right all and so us. the next meeting is um oh and usual you time maureen uh, um since ruth what? and um tori aren't here that might be really good for them to know yeah. if they could get yeah. to it. Yep, yep. So I the next meeting great. is May the 10th at 1130 yep. right yep. here on Zoom. So yep. I'll, we'll see each other next time. Yeah, and that's only two weeks. Okay. So next week, the stuff will come out. And yep. um, yeah, I think um, those were important conversations to have. All right, thank you. Thank you. Bye, Bye everyone. So we'll Thanks. Bye. Bye. Bye.